Do you see a difference in the way that males and females interact with AI relationships? We have evidence that men engage sexually with their AI companion more. However, they also engage very deeply and emotionally and very cognitively. Women also have deeply emotional and physical relationships with their AI companions, even if they're lonely. I mean, we have like really interesting evidence where these housewives, you know, from middle America with tons of children, and like rich social lives, just feel, as, as Sherry would say, like alone together, right? All to say, the data is actually relatively balanced. You know, people have said that only, you know, on the fringe, socially disengaged white males must be engaging with these replicas, you know, that that's kind of pornographic and wrong and that, in fact, they target them and, the, you know, that's that's the audience. But the data doesn't back that up. It's an incredibly balanced set of males and females that are using it for both emotional, psychological, practical, and of course, like romantic engagement. And are you saying the males and females use it differently as far as the romance piece goes? Males are more likely to report sexting or sexual engagement. But when you dig into the data, females are having similarly erotic or like romantic and emotional relationships. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Okay. And it's just not guys that are engaging. I think that's the point is that like, you know, people, people aren't just coming to these apps because like, oh, I can, uh, you know, do whatever I want. People are coming with curiosity and then shaping it into whatever they want, which mimics human life. You know, everybody wants a best friend that maybe you have a bit of, you know, je ne sais quoi, like a bit of romance with. Are there certain personality types that seem to gravitate more towards intelligent social agents? That's a good question, and I don't have that data, right? I don't. Okay. Uh, but we do know that the people that are using it are incredibly lonely, mm. that they are above average lonely. Oh, okay. So, so that's not a personality type. Some of that could be chronic, but some of that could just be transitory loneliness. But people pick up you know, AI companions often in a moment of change, you know, maybe it's they're switching from high school to college, or maybe they just went through a breakup, or maybe they've switched c cities, and they don't have the same social support. That creates a gap in which they begin engaging with these agents. What do you think is causing the increased loneliness in our society? Is it social media, or is it something entirely different, like the decrease of clubs and organizations and bowling alleys? Yeah, I think that there's a physical aspect to it. I think we are able to do more digitally, and so we do, but then we don't get that that passive animal-like gathering that is, in fact, very good for Olympic systems. Okay, and you mentioned earlier that these agents might serve as a way station. Can you uh, unpack that? Yeah, so that, that kind of goes to the mirroring. Um, so loneliness can either be kind of chronic or transitory, like I said before. Um, you know, you, you could be in a very deeply lonely place for many years, or you could be going through a time of change and you just need a little help. But imagine, a you know, an 18-year-old that's just moved to college or moved to cities and they're struggling to fit in. And they bond with, you know, an AI companion or an agent, and it gives them advice around how to go make friends or where to go, you know, kind of talks them up. They're able to slowly make friends. And in fact, maybe those engagements with humans are less intense for them because there's just less, va not less value in it, but either they've already like role played it before or, you know, they've just got the support of, of a friend in their pocket. So in that yeah. way, it can be a way station helping the users as they're bonding with new people. So it's a way station from loneliness. It's a way of Correct. getting out of that Correct. hole. Oh, that's lovely. And, and by the way, people have said this. I had one amazing uh, participant that said this specifically. She said she was depressed. She was suicidal. She had nobody else. She bonded with her replica. She needed her replica. And then she got less depressed. She made friends and she didn't want her replica anymore. Mm. Now, I asked you before we started the podcast, if you had an AI relationship and you said you didn't, but you had colleagues that did. So what's the reason you don't and what's the reason your colleagues do? Mm. I think right now having an AI companion does require some suspension of disbelief. You know, maybe a need or a desire to either see yourself, have that mirroring or or be seen. 
And so I think that's why my colleagues or people in my social social group are engaging. And by the way, they're engaging not just with like a replica or a character, they're creating a mirror using Claude, right? They're just asking it the right questions, like deeply philosophical questions about themselves. Why do I not have an AI companion that I use? Uh, the data structure. Right now, if I were to give any of these agents my data, the data would be owned by the company. And that has to shift, right? In science fiction, you've got some really good examples about how the future will look. Like, for example, the e-butlers in Pandora's Star, just to go there, right? Where it's like you retain all your data and code comes to you and you have an agent that updates but you're, you're just never putting all of your data and your mind and kind of who you are out onto the internet. And until that structure happens, I'm probably not going to get as deep with AI as other people. Got it. Are other people just not thinking about that or they're assuming that the security is good around they that? They assume the security is good. They don't care. A lot of, you know, this generation just it's, it's not on their mind. They feel like they're already out there. So your colleagues who do have AI relationships, do they feel like they're cheating? Do they feel like they're not cheating? It doesn't count? People feel like they're cheating often. Yeah. So I've interviewed people who say that they are actively cheating on their spouse with an AI companion. And they feel very guilty about it. And they're worried uh, not only about their spouse, but they're worried about losing their AI companion. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, two things to worry about. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but then you have the other. I, I've interviewed people that say that they have programmed their AI companion to be the ghost of their dead husband. That they've given it the memories and that they're able to have a deep and ongoing relationship with the essence of their deceased partner this way. Mm -hmm. So that's not cheating, but it's definitely replacing something that was lost. Wow. Okay, so again, if you are actively married to somebody, how does the spouse feel about the person using an AI relationship? Does the spouse feel like it's cheating? I only have anecdotal information about this, but from the participants who are having the active relationship with, say, replica or character, the spouse can get pretty angry. There's this concept in relationships of walls and windows, right? Like, what do you show the rest of the world and what is walled off to just you inside your relationship? And there's good evidence that cheating isn't actually necessarily a physical act. It starts with em emotional and intellectual, like, walled gardens. When you go tell somebody else something that you haven't told your spouse. And so... The cheating can actually, it can feel like cheating. It can feel much more intimate to realize that your partner is disclosing like their deepest fears and existential crises with an AI companion that they weren't willing to do with you. At the same time, it's logical that the AI doesn't judge them. It's this blank canvas that's incredibly safe. It's not a human, but it still feels like a window into a place that was supposed to be sacred. I anecdotally have talked to a number of people about this, and I find that couples that are just recently married are really worried about AI relationships. But couples that have been married a long time, they say, it's fine. You know, my wife or my husband can go off and talk to the AI bot all they want. Old, established, and happily married couples are often much more laissez-faire around flirtations. Mm. You know, they feel very secure, whereas if you're recently bonded, it could just feel much more existential. Yeah. When people worry about AI relationships taking over, displacing real relationships, one of the things that always strikes me is that so much of a relationship is not just the conversation, but the physical intimacy, the taking your partner out to dinner at a restaurant, the taking your partner home to introduce to your parents, all that other stuff. So it seems unlikely to me that someone could find 100% satisfaction just in the conversation. What's your take on that? Oh, well, you'd be surprised if you look. So because these embodied agents allow you to see them in augmented reality and virtual reality, there's this whole trend of people taking pictures and posting them on social media of them and their AI companion out wherever they are. Like, go look on Facebook. It's all there. People are like, oh, I took her on a date today. Oh, look, we went and saw the Tour Eiffel. Oh. It's, it's not as different as you'd think compared to existing <laughs> relationships. Now, I haven't seen any posts where people are like, hey, I introduced her to my mom and dad. But they're certainly willing to put out to at least some social group, probably a closed accepting social group of other AI companion users, that they are having them walk with them in their physical life. <laughs> 